Welcome to this educational program. This module discusses penile prosthesis implantation or erectile dysfunction. This information is taken from a recent review of the medical literature and attempts to be as comprehensive as possible. Please feel free to view this presentation as many times as necessary. You may also use the player on your left to repeat slides or to skip through them in any order you wish. Erectile dysfunction, sometimes called ED or impotence, is the repeated inability to get or keep an erection firm enough for sexual intercourse. The penis contains two chambers called the corpora cavernosa, or erectile bodies, which run the length of the organ as shown here. A spongy tissue fills the chambers, which contains smooth muscles, fibrous tissues, spaces, veins, and arteries. The urethra, which is the channel for urine and ejaculate, or semen, runs along the underside of the corpora cavernosa and is surrounded by the corpus spongiosum. The corpora cavernosa are surrounded by a fibrous membrane called the tunica albuginea. When the corpora fill with blood during erection, this membrane helps to compress the veins in the penis, allowing blood to accumulate in the corporal bodies and keeping the erection firm. 80% of cases of erectile dysfunction are related to an underlying physical or medical cause. Some of these can be modified through lifestyle changes, etc., while others cannot. Common physical causes include aging, hardening of the small arteries, called atherosclerosis, which can be caused by high blood pressure, smoking, obesity, and genetic factors, medical illnesses, such as diabetes and kidney failure, several medications, hormone changes, pelvic surgery and trauma, and certain neurological diseases. These and other causes are discussed in more detail in a separate module. ED can be treated at any age, and many treatment options exist. The best treatment varies depending on an individual's situation, and your doctor will use all the information at hand to choose the best treatment for you. Treatment options include lifestyle changes, adjusting medications, psychotherapy such as counseling and behavior modification, oral medications or pills, topical medications such as creams and gels, vacuum devices, injection of medication into the penis, and surgery, including penile implants. A penile implant may be chosen when there is a clear medical cause for the ED and when the problem is unlikely to resolve or improve naturally or with other medical treatments. Typically, all such treatment options have been tried already. Sometimes a penile prosthesis is implanted at the time of other reconstructive surgery such as at the time of straightening a curved penis affected by Peyronie's disease. Penile prostheses are devices that are implanted completely within the body. They produce an erect state that enables a man to have normal sexual intercourse. There are two situations in which patients should not receive an implant until the problem is corrected. Patients with an active infection of the genital area or urinary tract are best to avoid implantation until the infection is completely treated. Similarly, some patients are particularly susceptible to infection for different reasons and should be very cautious when considering an implant. Penile implants should not be used when significant untreated bladder outlet obstruction is present, such as from an enlarged prostate or scarring in the urinary tract, because a prosthesis can increase the outflow obstruction and eventually produce urinary retention, which is the inability to urinate. Again, once these problems are successfully treated, an implant can be considered. The main objective of penile prosthesis implantation is to leave the patient with a penis that allows achievement of sexual intercourse with no complications when it is desired and in a way that satisfies both partners. There is no single penile prosthesis that is best for all patients. There are two major categories of penile prostheses. These include mechanical and malleable rods which produce varying degrees of rigidity and inflatable prostheses, which include the two-piece and three-piece varieties. There is no single penile prosthesis that is best for all patients, so it is imperative that you sit down with your urologist and carefully review the risks, benefits, and drawbacks to each type. The next section will go over the important features of each device. The semi-rigid prosthesis will provide an erection sufficient for penetration. A fair amount of twist can be placed on the penis without problems. Most of these prostheses have a low mechanical failure rate because there are no moving parts and a fairly simple implantation is possible. The downside to these 
is that they produce an erection that may be considered unsightly. Furthermore, these devices are the most likely to create an obstruction that can interfere with urination. Also, if prostate surgery is needed in the future, it can be very difficult because of the implant. Having said this, the rigid prosthesis is good for men with poor hand mobility who are relatively elderly or who do not want the increased risk of malfunction that can result from moving parts. The two-piece inflatable penile prosthesis offers a compromise between the multi-component inflatable and the semi-rigid device. The downside to this device is that it can sometimes be difficult to control. It doesn't become as erect as the rigid one and doesn't deflate as much as the multi-component inflatable prosthesis. Additionally, this device is limited to the average size penis and if the patient has a longer than average penis, it usually is not adequate. The multi-component inflatable prosthesis has been called the Cadillac device by some. It is called multi-component because it's made up of three pieces including a reservoir implanted under the groin muscles to store fluid, two cylinders inserted in the penis, and a pump which is placed under the skin of the scrotum. To inflate the prosthesis, the man presses on the pump. The pump transfers fluid from the reservoir to the cylinders in the penis, inflating them. Pressing on a deflation valve at the base of the pump returns the fluid to the reservoir, deflating the penis. The multi-component inflatable gives the best appearance when erect and is the softest when deflated. It is now the most widely used device. Prior to surgery, the genital area must be clean, preferably washed with a strong soap. As noted, there must not be any evidence of infection in the skin or the urinary tract. Your doctors must be informed about all your medical conditions and medications you take, especially anything that may thin your blood, such as aspirin. Do not take aspirin-containing products or other blood thinners for 7 to 10 days prior to the operation without discussing it first with your doctor. After arrival to the operating room, an anesthetic will be given. This may be a general anesthetic, where the patient goes to sleep, or a spinal anesthetic, where the patient is frozen from the waist down. Antibiotics will be given in the operating room through an intravenous line. The skin will then be shaved, cleaned, and prepped, and the operation will then begin. The type of surgery for the implant is generally based on the surgeon's experience and the type of device chosen. Most often, a small cut is made either above the penis where it joins the abdomen or under the penis where it joins the scrotum. For a three-piece inflatable device, a second incision may need to be made in the lower part of the groin. No tissue is removed during this procedure, and blood loss is usually minimal. After surgery, the penis is dressed according to your surgeon's preference. A variety of different dressings are used. In the recovery room, you will be observed to ensure that you recover fully from your anesthetic and that you have good pain control and no significant nausea. Nurses will check the area to ensure that there is no significant bleeding and that the dressing is well applied. Finally, it is important that you are able to urinate normally prior to discharge. Written post-operative care instructions are usually given in the recovery room. And of course, you can always view this program again once you are home. Most often, surgery is done on an outpatient basis, meaning no overnight hospital stay. However, you may need to spend one night in hospital. If you are going home the day of surgery, you should have a ride home arranged in advance as you are legally not allowed to drive home after most anesthetics. If a spinal anesthetic was given in the operating room, it will provide relief for up to six hours, and you may be quite comfortable in the recovery room. Once you are home, if okay with your doctor, take extra strength Tylenol or ibuprofen right away, and every six hours for the first day. An ice pack may also be applied to the area for 20 minutes every hour. Finally, Stronger painkillers, usually narcotics, like Tylenol with codeine or oxycodone, are prescribed and should be used for breakthrough pain only. Try to keep the dressing dry for 24 to 48 hours. Do not shower or bathe for at least 24 hours. It is usually recommended to remove the dressing 48 hours after surgery. Despite your doctor's best efforts, these dressings often fall off much earlier. If it does, do not be alarmed. Remove the dressing in the shower if it is stuck to the skin. Remember that dissolvable stitches are almost always used. Apply an antibiotic ointment, such as polysporin, at least twice daily for a week to the wound and take any antibiotics as prescribed by your doctor. Recommendations for returning to normal activities vary widely, 
and it is best to ask your doctor for details. As a general recommendation, it is best to remember that if it hurts, don't do it. Soreness and swelling of the penis may last for a couple days to a couple weeks. You should be okay to resume work once you are comfortable, but this should be discussed with your doctor. You should also ask your doctor about when to resume sexual activity. Recommendations vary from two to six weeks. Keep in mind that erections early after surgery may tear sutures. Also keep in mind that with inflatable devices, your doctor may want to leave them deactivated, meaning that they don't work, for several weeks until full healing has occurred. Instructions on this will vary. You should communicate with your surgeon, family doctor, or emergency room if any of the following are noted after the operation. Fresh and ongoing bleeding. Significant discoloration of the penis. High fever. An inability to urinate an inability to control pain, a discharge of pus or spreading redness, continuous drainage from the wound, or progressive swelling of the penis, scrotum, or incision site. While men who have had a prosthesis implanted and their partner will be able to see the small surgical scar or scars, others will not. When the penis is inflated, the prosthesis makes the penis stiff and thick, similar to a natural erection. Most men report the erection as being a different size than their normal erection. However, the implant does not really change the physical size of the penis. It only makes it hard and soft or bendable. Partners sometimes say that the implant makes the penis feel somewhat harder than the natural erection. A penile prosthesis should not change sensation on the skin of the penis or a man's ability to reach orgasm. Ejaculation is not affected. Once a penile prosthesis is put in, however, it may destroy the natural erection reflex. Men usually cannot get an erection without inflating the implant. If the implant is removed, the man may never again have natural erections. About 90 to 95 percent of inflatable prosthesis implants produce erections suitable for intercourse. Satisfaction rates with the prosthesis are very high, and typically 80 to 90 percent of men are satisfied with the results and say they would choose the surgery again. There are always potential risks involved when undergoing surgery. Possible complications associated with penile implants are listed here. Uncontrolled bleeding after surgery, possibly leading to reoperation, can rarely occur, but bleeding to the point of requiring transfusion is even more rare. Infection can occur with any operation and is of particular concern when placing foreign materials like prostheses into the body. Infection rates less than 5% have been quoted for these implantation procedures, and this may become less common with modern implants that are covered with an antibacterial coating. Scar tissue formation around the device can occur, which can limit their ability to expand the penis. Another concern of these procedures is erosion of parts, particularly the cylinders, through the skin of the penis or into the urinary tract. This is caused by breakdown of the tissue around the device. This may occur with time simply as the tissue thins out, or it may be associated with infection, or from having a catheter tube or other instrument passed down the urethra. Finally, mechanical failure can occur with any type of prosthesis, and this would require revision or replacement of the device. This may be the case in as many as 20% over a period of 10 years from implantation. Overall, the revision rate for all reasons is about 30% at 10 years. In summary, the penile implant is an option when other less invasive treatments either do not work or are otherwise unacceptable in the treatment of erectile dysfunction. Several types of implants are available, and the newer devices are providing excellent results and lower risk of infection. Implant surgery has to be individualized to each patient to choose the proper device, and a full discussion with your doctor and your partner are essential before proceeding. This slide lists some of the many resources available where you can find more information about erectile dysfunction and penile prostheses. These modern references, available at your local medical library or through the internet, were used to assist in preparing this presentation. We sincerely hope that this module has furthered your understanding of penile prosthesis implant surgery as a therapy for erectile dysfunction. We wish you the best for the future, and thank you once again for viewing this educational program.